Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the QT Faculty of Law, to our symposium on copyright law and the creative industries. Uh, the purpose of this event is to bring together creative practitioners, uh, cultural, institutional representatives, and uh, legal academics and lawyers uh, to discuss the intersection between copyright law, creativity, and culture. As is always the case at QUT, um, in keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where QUT now stands and recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning. We wish to pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within the QUT community. Stephanie Parkin uh, recently received her uh, Master's of Philosophy at QUT, doing work on the inquiry into inauthentic art and craft. Uh, she has also recently kind of appeared um, before the Senate Select Inquiry into the Aboriginal flag. We're very pleased and grateful that Stephanie Parkin um, is here to discuss the exploitation of art and culture and the law. Thank you. Um, as Matt mentioned, my name is Stephanie and I'm from the Kwanamoka people of North Strawberry Island, also known as Njuruma. Today I will be sharing with you uh, some insights into my recently completed master's research at QUT into the issue of inauthentic art and craft products in the souvenir market. I will also touch, briefly touch on the current issue relating to the Aboriginal flag, copyright, ownership, licensing issues and community expectations. For the purposes of my research, uh, master's research, I looked at the problem of Aboriginal style products that have a, the look and feel of being made by an Aboriginal person, but are in fact created entirely by non-Indigenous people, usually manufactured and created overseas, and imported into Australia, usually by non-Indigenous businesses, um, and sold uh, in the Australian marketplace, usually within the souvenir market. So the research problem looked at this uh, issue of inauthentic art and craft products and what can be done about the issue from a legal and non-legal perspective. The important point being here when thinking about inauthentic art and craft was the fact that these Aboriginal style products that visually looked like they were made by an Aboriginal person was in fact created without their knowledge or consent. To give an example of some of the products that I'm thinking about and talking about um, today in this presentation. So these are some examples on the slide. So on one of the pictures you have a boomerang that's potentially made out of bamboo uh, that has a sticker on it that says made in Indonesia. And it also has on the top of that boomerang uh, some, I suppose, stereotypical visual uh, designs and symbols that people would ordinarily associate with Aboriginal people and Aboriginal artists. So this is the research problem. Um, so my research primarily looked at consumer law, although there were some considerations of copyright law as well. One of the initial challenges with copyright law uh, was that it doesn't protect uh, styles of work. So in the context of Aboriginal people and Aboriginal art, copyright law protection, copyright law and its protection does not extend uh, to certain styles of work. So. Uh, that might be the dot style work or the rock style of design uh, that is unique uh, to the people of Arnhem Land. So the initial consideration from a legal perspective was that um, unless the works that were on the fake products were a direct or substantial copy, copyright law was unlikely um, to have any effect in these scenarios. Um, so then consideration was also then given to the Australian Consumer Law. Um, one of the initial challenges also with Australian consumer law is that it's only, con only concerned with misleading and deceptive conduct. Quite recently, uh, there was the ACCC uh, decision um, that 
related to action brought against Baruvi Art, Pink Floyd, LTV. So this case was quite important to my research. Um, in that case, the company made false claims that Aboriginal style souvenirs, including boomerangs, like those that I've just showed you, were made in Australia or otherwise hand painted by an Aboriginal person. So they were giving those representations that these products were made by an Aboriginal, made in Australia or made by an Aboriginal person. That actually wasn't true, and that was, that was found to be misleading to members of the public. While a $2.3 million fine was handed down by Justice Perry in that decision, uh, the company, Barubi Art, went into liquidation shortly before those orders were handed down. And unfortunately, the likelihood of uh, recovering any type of penalty in that case is very slim. One of the important things uh, in this case was that while it brings the attention of fake art more so into the consumer space and people understanding some of the issues, the case itself and the law that's applied in that case doesn't actually stop fake art from existing in the market. And that means that uh, reform needs to happen in this area. So the approach to my research uh, really followed uh, quite a few different steps that were taken over the years. So uh, there was the Fake Art Mums Culture Campaign. There were several bills that were introduced, one by Bob Catter, Senator Hans Sarah Hanson Young, um, that were trying to find ways from a legal perspective to try and fill the gap that existed within the current consumer law. There was also the inquiry that was announced, recommendations, and then also the Baruby case that I mentioned. So, so there was quite a few steps being taken over the last couple of years uh, in relation to this issue of inauthentic art and craft. I should mention, however, that this issue is not new. The issue has been around for decades. Um, but there have been quite a few inquiries and reports in cases uh, over the years in relation to this issue. So the approach to my research. So my uh, data set really focused on the 2017 inquiry into inauthentic, in, inauthentic art and craft products. Um, and really the, the base and foundation of the data that I looked at really comprised of all the submissions that people from around Australia um, and also uh, those within the industry, academics and lawyers all contributed to as part of this inquiry. Um, so I conducted a thematic analysis of the data set, so drawing out the themes that were quite important, what did people say about the issue of fake art and what were some of the solutions that they thought would be able to address this problem adequately. So there was 162 submissions, quite a few exhibits and public hearings as well. So this form all formed part of the analysis of my data. There were quite a few things that were revealed as I went through other uh, submissions. So some of the things that are worth noting around are these perspectives of authenticity. And authenticity meant different things to different people. I also in, uh, identified a range of different impacts of inauthentic art and craft and also the solutions proposed by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to stop uh, fake art from existing in the market. My research also then comprised an analysis of the proposed amendments to law, particularly from a consumer law perspective. And really the purpose of doing that was to reflect whether or not the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were actually reflected in the solutions that, that were being put forward change. So what came out of the inquiry? So there were some inquiry recommendations that were released in December 2018 and then also the government response to those inquiry recommendations. So uh, the government uh, agreed to conduct a productivity commission um, and they agreed in part to additional resourcing and consideration of the mandatory Indigenous art code. Um, there were some other recommendations that they just noted, so uh, the establishment of a separate arm of the Indigenous business sector, the development of an information standard and additional funding to combat the issue of carpet bagging uh, in relation to art dealers and artists. Uh, some of the other uh, recommendations that were supported, which was quite um, good to hear, was that they are open to consulting and developing standalone legislation that would uniquely protect and recognise uh, the intellectual property and cultural rights of Aboriginal people 
in their cultural expressions. And again, this is the, the call for standalone legislation is not new, but I suppose it's a good step to see that there is some indication from government to explore that further. Some of the findings that are worth sharing um, out of the analysis of the data um, was really this important use of language around different concepts. What I did find initially was that there was a real conflict between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal worldviews of what was meant by cultural expressions, art, and this was demonstrated by the requirement to define authentic as part of the inquiry terms of reference. For example, some of the uh, uh, words from the inauthentic art and craft inquiry that have been put forward by people. For example, the term authentic is not one that is used by most Aboriginal artists. However, addressing the term authentic was part of the inquiry terms of reference. So already there's a clash in terms of how the use of language um, is used by the, the committee and throughout the inquiry. A lot of the submissions by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists work with the connections that artists have with their arts and cultural practices. For example, Jane Young, submission by Reza, our art is who we are. It helps carry our culture from the past to now and into the future for our children and grandchildren. The stories we paint are from our grandmothers and grandfathers and theirs before them. Everything that goes into an artifact or painting is a part of us, it's a part of our culture and it's a part of our language. And again, the real connection that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists were talking about in relation to their works and the things that they produce, their cultural expressions. They talk about the interconnectedness of these works. My father taught me how to paint and tell stories that show we are connected with the land and the sea. We are the custodians of the land and we look after the land. We know the songs that connect us to the land. So from a lot of the evidence that was provided along these lines, it's a very clear message that the art and craft products that are produced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists are not just pieces of art. These are expressions of culture and stories and knowledge that have been passed down through generations. So one of the main issues that I did find was this clash between Western concepts and the language used around the inquiry terms of reference, and that being the lack of Aboriginal terms of reference. The way in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists spoke about their connection to art and cultural expression then really reinforced the way in which fake art impacts them. Um, so, as part of my research, I identified six general areas that were impacted by the existence of inauthentic art and craft. This included health and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists, and not only the artists, but people within the community, and more broadly within the community. So, these were physical, emotional and spiritual impacts that people felt because fake art exists, exists in the market and is allowed to be sold. There were cultural impacts. The words used by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were very strong and very clear about the negative impacts that they were feeling because fake art exists. They spoke about feeling exploited, denied, insulted, demeaned, disregarded, destroyed, and their culture being stolen. One of the more visible impacts was obviously the financial impacts that occurred, because when fake art exists, it's not benefiting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that money is going either overseas or to non-Indigenous people. The financial impact removes the ability for artists and their families to reap the benefits from the sale of their own cultural expressions. Um, it also impacted creativity. So when artists saw shelves stacked full of fake art and craft products in the shops that they go to, in the airports that they visited, when they saw that, it actually affects an artist's creativity to be able to continue working in that space. So there's a very real and very um, significant impacts. There were also impacts to consumers. So consumers were then faced with this idea of not really understanding what they were interacting with. Uh, they were given the, the false or misleading impression uh, that what they were engaging with was real when it actually wasn't. There were also impacts around national identity, which were really spoken about quite strongly 
from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. What does this actually mean for the fact that uh, inauthentic art and craft exists? What does that mean for Australia's national identity and what we hold up domestically and to the rest of the world as to who we are as a people and who we are as a nation if we're then able to allow fake art and the exploitation of first people's culture to exist? These are some of the impacts that were spoken about by Aboriginal artists. Um, Abe Moriata from Girigan Art Centre up in Cardwell. When he sees fake art, he said, it really hurts, it stings for me. It makes me feel ashamed and disgusted that Indigenous designs are stolen. There was also this real sense of how tired Indigenous people are having to address this issue of fake art because it has persisted for, for a very long time. One of the artists said, I'm here to voice my feelings about how tired we are as Indigenous people of watching our art being duplicated by other fake products flooding the market. And Bandak Marika, who's, who is an artist from Arnhem Land who's done much work in this area, she says, for us, our works are not just beautiful artworks. It is a privilege to actually own one. You become a type of custodian and need to look after it and not abuse our laws and culture. It causes us a great deal of pain when we see our clan designs copied by people who don't understand their importance or have permission to do so. So taking into account all the submissions and doing an analysis of what people were saying about the issue, how it impacted them greatly, what were then some of the legal approaches that could be formulated to address this issue? Um, so a lot of the submissions to the inquiry looked at this amendment to the Australian Consumer Law. Uh, while that was not uh, provided as a recommendation in the inquiry's report or supported by government, um, it was put forward as a way in which inauthentic art and craft could be stopped. Uh, and the way that that was suggested uh, was that an amendment to the Australian Consumer Law would prohibit uh, the creation and supply of any product that had the look and feel of being made by an Aboriginal person that wasn't actually made by an Aboriginal person. Um, so in effect, it actually had to be made by an Indigenous person or licensed under an appropriate licence agreement. Um, and if that, if that wasn't existing, then it would uh, prohibit the supply of that product. That was proposed as a short-term solution, a quick fix to address the issue. Um, and the, the longer term standalone legislation to protect Indigenous cultural and intellectual property legislation was recognised as that a longer term approach. And now that there is at least some indication from government to explore um, that further, we might see some further movement in that space. So while there was quite a focus on what the legal mechanisms were in relation to this issue, it was also quite important to understand that the law itself will not address this issue fully. Uh, and in that case, what that meant was non-legal issues, non-legal solutions also had to be proposed uh, as part of addressing the solution in a comprehensive and fulsome way. So some of the non-legal supporting mechanisms that were put forward was um, the recognition of history and the influence of current national identity. There needed to be continued engagement and education of artists to help them understand their intellectual property rights how to protect their rights and how to manage their rights through licensing opportunities. Um, also further opportunities for artists to actually promote their work. Um, and continued education for consumers and retailers uh, to understand the supply chains of how products get to their stores and also to understand the arrangements that might be in place for the use of those artists' artwork. Uh, one of the other really interesting components that was coming out of uh, the inquiry and the data that was put forward by those participating was this idea of how um, colonialism continues to play a really important part in the existence of fake art and craft products. Um, Professor Irene Watson um, identifies that colonialism continues to smother Aboriginal relationships to law, land and the natural world. And really in understanding that colonialism is not a thing of the past, it continues today. And the fact that fake art and craft exists is a true reflection of that being the case. 
Another important part of the series that underpinned a lot of the work was also this, I am a lot of the work from Professor Arawa about the power imbalances and hierarchies of power and control that determine what is of value. So that was really important to understand why this issue has been around for so long. People have been asking for reform and change for a very long time. People have been very clear in what needs to be done. Yet there's been quite a lack of action um, and movement in this area. And um, some of the reasons for that exist for those in, uh, in positions of power and hierarchy really don't see the value or understand the value of things. And if that's not understood, it's not valued and then it's not given protection. Uh, so that work was really important in understanding why issues like this continue uh, to not get the proper attention that they deserve. Um, so that was really a summary of the research that I conducted here at QUT. Um, and just to finish off with the presentation here, I thought it would be worthwhile touching on the issues around uh, the Aboriginal flag. Um, it is an issue that is currently in the media quite a lot, and there's recently been an inquiry around this issue. Um, so Harold Thomas is an Aboriginal man. He's the creator of the Aboriginal flag. Um, and over many years, he's entered into a range of different exclusive license agreements. Um, community, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, well, Aboriginal people across Australia have really endorsed the Aboriginal flag. They've given value to the flag. Uh, the Aboriginal flag has seen a lot, at a lot of our celebrations. Uh, it is not only uh, flown at the front of government buildings or education institutions. You will see the flag, uh, you know, hanging up in our people's homes. You'll see the flag at our celebrations and also at our funerals. So the Aboriginal flag over many years has been given quite a lot of value by us as Aboriginal people. Quite recently, there's been um, a dispute around one of the licensees who has the ability to, to use the flag on different products and merchandise. Um, and out of those concerns, the Aboriginal flag inquiry uh, was announced in September 2020. One of the issues that was really um, brought to the front was while one person might uh, be able to own copyright as an individual, so the artist owns the copyright in the Aboriginal flag and has the right to license the copyright and the work to other parties, there was this real expectation from people in the community that those who held those licenses should use that copyright in a way that aligns with community expectation and control. That didn't happen in relation to one of these exclusive licensees. So there's been quite a lot of distress in our, in our communities, with some community organisations being having received cease and desist letters for not paying the use of the Aboriginal flag. Um, so it's quite a, a distressing uh, point of time for our people. And I think what this really shows, again, is the clash between copyright law and the rights of the artist. By law, he's entitled to do that. But the arrangement that he's entered into does not align with community expectations. So the law and what community says is really uh, clashing here in relation to this Aboriginal flag issue. It is a difficult issue. Um, and so the uh, inquiry committee handed down two uh, recommendations uh, this month. Uh, there were some questions around whether or not the federal government should compulsorily acquire the copyright from the artist. Um, and one of the recommendations was that the government does not go down that process. Um, and recommendation two was that uh, the current negotiations that are between the federal government and Harold Thomas as the artist, that those discussions continue. And that is proposed that those uh, discussions have some type of model or structure uh, that ensures that the flag is to be able to used to be able to be used from a body that's independent to government, um, and also while ensuring that the integrity of the Aboriginal flag uh, is maintained. So while this issue has gotten quite a lot of media attention, there has now been an inquiry into the issue. Um, it really doesn't seem resolved at this stage, so it will be interesting to see um, what comes of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.